India. Hopefully, Plaksha will do the same in technology. I believe that India has world-class students. Our vision is to provide the opportunity to build technological solutions for the future. This is why I'm involved in this project, a university for the future. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for making the time to join us for this open house. This is indeed a very trying time for everyone, and our prayers are with all of you for the good health of your loved ones. With that, let me introduce you to today's session. We have threefold objectives today. One is to introduce you to Plaksha's overall vision, which we will do briefly at the start. Second is to unravel and deep dive into one of Plaksha's unique undergrad majors, that has been drawing significant interest, which is the data science, economics, and business major. And third is to answer any questions that you may have related to this major or Plaksha in general. I extend a very warm welcome to two distinguished panelists we have with us here today. First, we have Professor Narahari, who is an academician of global eminence. He completed his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral studies at the Indian Institute of Science subsequently joined ISC as a faculty in computer science and automation. He went on to chair the department and now chairs the entire division of electrical, electronics, and computer sciences. He was also a postdoctoral researcher at MIT in the 90s. The focus of his current research is very interesting. It is to apply game theory, mechanism design, and machine learning to research problems at the interface of computer science and economics. There is indeed no better person to guide the creation of Plaksha's interdisciplinary program. And we are really privileged to have Professor Narahari contribute his time to build this curriculum. We also have with us Shrikant Velamakini, who is the co-founder, group chief executive, and vice chairman of Fractal Analytics. Through Fractal, Shrikant has played a role in the evolution of the analytics industry itself. Long before data science, and big data became buzzword. Fractal had evangelized the idea of using advanced analytics and data assets of companies to make better decisions. Shrikan did a bachelor's in electrical engineering at IIT Delhi and MBA at IIM Ahmedabad. He is also founder and trustee at Plaksha. Over to you, Shrikant, to introduce the vision and mission of Plaksha. Thank you, Pallavi. Um, the key goal of Plaksha University is to create world leaders of tomorrow. We, have very, we are very ambitious about the kinds of students we want and the kinds of education we want to provide. We want to create, we want to reimagine higher education. We want to reimagine what it is to teach the leaders of tomorrow. And therefore, we have thought about the, the undergrad program in a way that many, very few universities can actually think about today because they have such a strong legacy of doing things in a certain way. We said, what if we could build a Stanford or a Berkeley or, or a Harvard grounds up, MIT, for example, if you were to build it grounds up, how will engineering education look like? First thing we realized is it has to be interdisciplinary. Just like Pallavi was mentioning, uh, Dr. Narahari is on the cutting edge of economics and AI. Right. Similarly, if you were to solve a robotics problem, it is on the edge of its in the intersection of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, computer science, and AI. If you think of a risk management problem, it is at the intersection of understanding credit risk and finance, algorithms and AI, and even engineering and tech skills. So we believe that interdisciplinary education is a future of great problem solving, developing great leaders of tomorrow. Secondly, we believe that. It's we have to create great leaders of tomorrow. They have to have solid understanding of how the world really works, how human beings actually behave, and the history of the understanding of history of how humans have evolved so far, because that will be critical to solving problems of tomorrow. If you want to solve a problem like climate change or global warming, you need people have, who have a balanced perspective, have a full understanding of that. Therefore, we have integrated psychology, humanities, and design and entrepreneurship into the program. Thirdly, we think the way people will learn is different. The, gone are the days of textbooks and classrooms where you would teach and give homework. It's actually, it, classes have got, become flipped. 
So the pedagogy has changed and we are bringing in new ways of learning, learning by doing, learning in a, in a, in a, in a way that you can learn from each other. So that kind of a blending, le blended learning is something that we are trying to bring about as well. And finally, I think if you have to build great leaders of tomorrow, they have to be great leaders of themselves. They have to manage themselves very well. They could potentially change the world. They have to lead the world. Therefore, we want people who can manage themselves and manage people around them as well. That's the future of the engineering education that we're imagining. This team that has come together is very, very, very uh, successful and very distinguished. Entrepreneurs, CEOs from around the world, you can see that across the globe have come together with that one mission. It's a philanthropic mission to reimagine higher education. And that's how Plaksha has been born. And there's some brilliant, successful entrepreneurs and CEOs who are part of this journey. And the, the faculty is specifically very, very interesting. And actually the, the academic advisory board is a who's who of the world. You can look at Abhijit Banerjee, who's a Nobel Prize winner, as you all know. Dr. Kaushik Basu, for example, I'll, I'll just to take one of those examples. He's an eminent economist. He has been the chief economist of the World Bank from 2012 to 2016. He has been the chief economic advisor to the government of India from 2009 to 2012. And he's taught at various universities, including Harvard, MIT, Princeton, and Cornell. We have distinguished people like these who are part of the academic advisory board. And it's great to see these minds seeing the opportunity to create a new, new, new way of education, getting really excited and building the curriculum that you will all be experiencing. We have four key disciplines here. And the one of today's focus is data science, business and economics and business, but we have interdisciplinary uh, majors, four majors. One is called computer science and AI. As you know, AI is changing the world and it's at the, at the cutting edge of computer science and AI is, is AI at scale, right? How are you solving? How does Google give you a result in 0.2 to seconds and so well? That's a kind of question if you wanna answer, you need to do computer science and AI. Robotics and cyber physical systems, I've already mentioned, uh, these are again, interdisciplinary problems. Biological systems engineering, again, at the cutting edge of biology and math and engineering. And finally, the one of interest today is data science, economics, and business. Like I said, most business problems today require, and, and when you hear something like AI transformation, digital transformation, it's about smarter way of building businesses. It is on the cutting edge of business understanding, economics and human understanding, and also, how data can be used to make better decisions. So that's the focus of today's discussion. The way we have imagined the engineering education for all of you is that the first three semesters are called the Freshmore curriculum. This is common to all, all the four majors. So this, this is the foundation really of what you will learn. And you can see some very, very interesting courses here. You know, for example, look at mathematics and statistics and math of uncertainty, or thinking of how do uh, the fundamentals of microeconomics or design thinking, because if you want problem solvers and leaders of tomorrow, and if you have to reimagine engineering and higher education in general, this is how we feel the engineering education will look, a bunch of interdisciplinary subjects, which is common to all the four majors. At the end of these three semesters, if you have a math background, if you have a science background, you can pick any of that. Any of these, any of the four, uh, any of the four disciplines, um, and the faculty we have we are putting together a brilliant full-time faculty set. Right, there are several visiting faculty, but these are the eminent professors who have already joined the mission of Plaksha and are beginning to teach. We have a TLF program, a graduate-level program, where many of these teachers are already teaching. Now, coming to the data science, economics, and business program at Plaksha, let me of, describe that a little bit. It is at the intersect. If you can go to the next slide, please. It is at the intersection of data science, business, and economics, like you said. And once you have actually done the course, I mean, where are the places that you can potentially? Can you have the slide up, please? Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay. Once you have um, completed this course, you have roles across a whole range of industries because you could be a financial analyst, a data scientist, a business analyst, an economic analyst. Uh, you can join industry in roles like data science in, uh, or 
analytical consulting roles, you could also go ahead and start a tech business of your own because you have really understood the basics of building a business as well as the data, data science elements of building that business, right? It can also lead you to higher research. We are, we are building the leaders of tomorrow, but we are also interested in research. People who want to go ahead and do more research after this have pathways into different kinds of graduate, graduate level programs across the globe. And finally, from a recruiter standpoint, there are significantly big companies who are very interested. This is, as you may have heard, uh, data science is the sexiest profession of the 21st century. It's really hard and the world is really starved of high quality data scientists. And I'm thinking about it, if I was an undergrad student, I would have loved to take this program on. This program didn't exist back when I was graduating, when, back when I was in the fray for getting engineering education. But I believe that the, the students who graduate from here will have potential to join the biggest and the best companies around the world. Now to just give, give you an example, we have a program called the Tech Leaders Fellowship Program, which is a graduate level program, which is already in the second year of, uh, of, its, uh, of its existence. And in the first year, the first batch has been placed in a range of very exciting companies. For example, some of the consulting firms, some of the tech titans, and even companies which are, for example, if you look at this company called RCCM, it's doing algorithmic trading. Again, at the cutting edge of algorithms and finance. So you will see some very exciting opportunities like this come your way once you finish your undergrad program from a job standpoint. And in fact, there are several of them who are entrepreneurs as well. Okay, now let's see what are the applications at the intersection of data science, business and economics, just to give you a flavor. And we have, there, there are some specializations that we, we have towards, the, towards your later, latter half of your engineering education. And I'd like to now trans, transfer it to Dr. Narahari to walk us through his perspective of data science, business, economics, and business, especially from a computer science lens that he wears. Over to you, Dr. Narahari. Uh, thank you, Srikant, for uh, a wonderful introduction to the data science, economics, and business program. Um, uh, I'm basically a computer science person. Uh, I work in the computer science and automation department uh, at the Indian Institute of Science. And uh, it has actually taken me 20 years to be able to work on the kind of applications at the interface of data science, economics, and business. It has actually taken me 20 years. But uh, anybody who registers for the BTEC in DSEB program at Plaksha will be able to work on all these exciting applications in the next four years. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, I would like to take you to this uh, Hall of Fame where uh, on the left side, you have uh, you know, outstanding game theorists starting with the John von Neumann. And on the right side, uh, you have uh, computer scientists who are, who are legendary. Many of them happen to be Turing Award winners, which is the equivalent of Nobel Prize for computer science. And on the left side, we have uh, many of them who have actually won a Nobel Prize in uh, economic sciences. Uh, so the first picture that you would see is that of John von Neumann. Let me tell you very briefly about uh, uh, the brilliant work that he has done. In the 1920s, uh, he collaborated with uh, another economist called Oscar Morgenstern, and they were at the center of uh, you know, advanced study at Princeton. And uh, during the 20s and 30s, John von Neumann was actually responsible for two intellectual currents. One is game theory. So with uh, Oscar Morgenstern, he was able to lay the foundations of uh, uh, game theory, an exciting uh, discipline in economics. And at the same time, he was also working on foundations of uh, uh, computing, like uh, he was the one who came up with the notion of an algorithm and complexity of an algorithm. So he was basically uh, inventing two intellectual currents at the same time, game theory and computer science. This was in the 20s and 30s. And uh, astonishingly, uh, almost like uh, 50 to 60 years later, 
these two disciplines, game theory, which is the foundation for economics and uh, computer science have come together and there is a convergence of game theory and computer science, which has now led to uh, a new area called algorithmic game theory, which is right at the interface of microeconomics uh, and uh, computer science. And you can see that uh, the foundations for algorithmic game theory have been laid by all the celebrities in economics and computer science that you see uh, in this picture. So let's uh, go to uh, the kind of exciting applications that game theory and mechanism design um, you know, are able to you know, open up. Uh, let's look at the first example. Uh, this is the example of uh, a cake cutting problem. And most of you would be familiar with this problem. Uh, what is this problem? So there is uh, a happy mother and she has two kids. And uh, she, there is also a beautiful cake. And uh, this cake has to be shared equally between kid one and kid two. What the mother can do is to take the best knife and then slice this cake into exactly two equal portions and then give these portions to these two kids. But these two kids will not be happy with that because each of the kids will feel that uh, what he or she got is uh, the smaller of the two slices. That is, that is how uh, neither of the kids will feel very happy about it. So what uh, the mother will do is actually to induce a game uh, on the two kids here. And this is what is called as mechanism design. She's a mechanism designer. She designs uh, a mechanism. And uh, in this mechanism, what she says is she gives the knife to the first kid and tells the kid, why don't you slice it into two portions? But the second kid will get the chance to pick up one of these uh, two slices. So now the first kid, which is rational and intelligent, what it means is that the first kid is actually uh, trying to maximize its own utility. So what the first kid uh, will naturally think is that the second kid, which gets the chance to pick up one of these two slices, will pick up the larger of the two slices. But uh, since kid one would like to get exactly half of the portion, the kid one will take all the care in the world to slice this particular cake into exactly two equal portions. And then the second kid, which gets the chance to pick up one of these two slices, will now look at these two slices and will pick up what she thinks is the larger of the two slices. So you can see that there is a beautiful problem which has been solved very nicely by the mother by inducing a game. This is the power of game theory and mechanism design. Now, this problem itself may look very innocuous, but imagine that uh, kid one happens to be the Karnataka state and kid two happens to be the Tamil Nadu state and the cake in between happens to, happens, uh, to be the Kaveri waters. And there is always a problem between the Karnataka state and Tamil Nadu state. And you can see how game theory and mechanism design come together to solve this uh, beautiful problem. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, I would uh, like to give you a series of examples now to bring out the power of how computer science and economics can come together. For example, here uh, we have an auction for selling an item. Imagine that there is one item for which there are four bidders and the bids from these uh, uh, players are 80 rupees, 60 rupees, 45 rupees, and 40 rupees. Well, this could be, this could just be, this could even be 80 million rupees, 60 million rupees, and so on. Now, what uh, Vikri basically said was that whoever bids the highest uh, will win this indivisible item, uh, but uh, this person will not pay the highest bid, which is equal to 80, but will pay the second highest bid. And uh, so what will happen is that uh, the bidders know that they're actually going to pay something less than 
what they have bid. So they will be very aggressive in bidding. And he actually showed, William Vickery actually showed in his Nobel Prize winning work that this particular auction will actually uh, extract the true valuations that all the players have for uh, this particular item. In other words, this is an auction which has the proper, pro uh, which has the property of inducing honesty and also a truth revelation by all the players. So he was able to design such auctions, not only for selling an item, next slide, but also for, uh, shall we go to the next slide, please? Uh, so there is a reverse auction where instead of selling, you're actually buying and these principles can be used even for buying also. Uh, so you can see that, uh, you know, the power of, uh, you know, mechanism design um, goes beyond auctions into many real world systems. For example, if we look at the next slide, um, we have... Uh, uh, a sponsored such auction. Now, this is a very powerful example of how game theory and mechanism design are generating billions of dollars to all of these search engine com companies and portals. Here, here is uh, something that you are very familiar with, uh, Google search engine. When you do a search on a particular keyword, then on the left side, you will get uh, a very large number of organic links. On the right side, you will get sponsored links. And now, uh, who will get displayed as the first item on the sponsored slot? Who will get displayed second, third, and so on? Is completely decided by uh, a mechanism, actually an auction. It will decide the positions of the various advertisers and it will also decide how much the advertisers are going to pay. What is going to happen is that when a user clicks on any one of these sponsored links, that particular advertiser will end up paying a certain amount of money to Google. And using game theory and mechanism design, Google is able to come up with uh, an auction mechanism which will determine the positions and also payments. And that uh, produces uh, uh, to the tune of uh, 60 to 70 percent of the whole revenue of uh, search engines comes through these advertising auctions. And you can see the power of uh, you know, game theory and mechanism design and economics in general, and of course, computer science. Let's go to the next slide. I do not have too much more time. Uh, I will just flash these examples and say that uh, you know, if you do the course on data science, economics, and business, you will be in a position to architect and design uh, many exciting kind of systems. For example, you will be able to design a matching market, which will match students to colleges, employees to companies, doctors to hospitals, farmers to consumers, and so on. So these are matching markets. And if you want to design a market, matching market, which is sustainable, which maximizes the social welfare and induces honest behavior from all the stakeholders there, then you can see that uh, the interface of data science, uh, economics, and business is going to help you. Now let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, I will not spend too much time on this. Uh, this was uh, a DARPA challenge for locating 10 red balloons uh, in continental America. And there was a team from MIT which was able to locate all these red balloons uh, using principles of game theory and mechanism design. Just uh, you know, go to, go to any search engine and do uh, a search on uh, DARPA red balloon challenge problem, and you will find all the exciting details about this problem. Let's go to the next slide, uh, which shows that uh, you know um, the the blend, the combination of data science, uh, economics, and business will also help you to do incentive design for massively open online courses. Because here, what you would like to do is to retain your students as much as possible. And uh, what you would like to do is to minimize the dropout rate of the students. And then you also want to maximize the learning by the students. So this will call for design of incentives for the instructors, design of incentives for the students so that the MOOC platform becomes sustainable. Here again, you will see the power of uh, data science and economics coming into play to make uh, you know, such platforms very successful. Let's go to the next uh, two examples which have to deal with uh, agriculture. 
which is uh, the most prominent and uh, the uh, it, 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 it is the major occupation of uh, majority of india's population if you want to design agricultural markets for example based on historical pricing data climate data and cost of cult cultivation data if you want to predict the crop prices and this will be such prediction of crop prices will be very useful to the farmers to plan their own uh, sort of farming and uh, also uh, in many of these agricultural markets uh, the farmers are at a loss to find out how they should be uh, you know making revenue out of uh, all the complicated mechanisms that they're going on so here again using data science uh, and the principles of economics mostly game theory and mechanism design you will be able to design agricultural markets which uh, you know are very successful and which are very friendly to the farmers my final example is on using uh, a branch of game theory called cooperative game theory, which will actually enable coalitions or combination or groups of uh, players to come together. Here, groups of farmers can come together and uh, they can do joint cultivation. And then all the uh, revenues that are obtained through this joint cultivation can be shared in a very fair way among the farmers and this kind of a coming together of, of the farmers has lots and lots of advantages and cooperative game theory and again data science data is going to be very important for all of these so data driven cooperative game theory will help you to design cooperative farming enterprises which are going to be very good for the farmers so i have given you a glimpse of uh, a spectrum of examples all of this has become possible because of uh, the very deep contributions of uh, game theorists uh, the, and economists. And uh, you can see that uh, since 2005, there are as many as um, you know nine uh, economists who have got the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences, and they're all they all happen to be game theorists who have contributed to game theory and uh, mechanism design uh, so let me not uh, get into the details of all of these uh, i just want to say uh, let's go to the next slide so this is going to be uh, my almost last slide uh, why is economics and competition very important or why is data science economics and business uh, very exciting to study first of all uh, it is deep science uh, if we are looking at just uh, the game theory and mechanism design part of it, it is uh, algorithmic game theory, market design, computational social choice, then interface of machine learning and game theory, and uh, you know very deep theoretical results. So it is deep science. It is deep tech because if you are looking at the uh, spectrum of applications like internet advertising, crowdsourcing, uh, it could be smart power grids, uh, you know, drones, robots, and autonomous systems, traffic networks, social networks, matching markets, cybersecurity, agriculture, education, you name the application, you will see that data science, uh, economics, and business beautifully come together to provide a holistic solution to the problems, and it, it involves deep tech. And I would say that, uh, you, know, um, you know, economics and business uh, and in, in my case, game theory, for example, it, it will lead to AI++. What I mean by AI++ is that uh, you have uh, a very rich AI and ML toolkit right now. However, without game theory and mechanism design, such a toolkit will be incomplete because uh, if you are looking at modern AI-powered systems, the stakeholders or the agents or the players in these systems are very, very strategic. So if you want to maximize social welfare in the presence of strategic nature of interactions of all of these uh, agents, you will see that uh, game theory and mechanism design become very important. So I hope I have conveyed to you uh, the excitement of uh, blending data science, economics, and business from a game theory and mechanism design viewpoint. And you will see that when you do the BTEC in DSEB program here, 
uh, you will do the kind of uh, course work which will enable you uh, to engage in these lovely and lively uh, kind of uh, problems that i have talked about let me tell you that it has taken me 20 years i started working in game theory perhaps in 2001 or so it has actually taken me 20 years for me to understand uh, the power of game theory in all of these applications. But you know, in the next four years, when you join this BTECIN DSEB program, uh, you will be doing the found, you'll be doing foundational uh, computation, economics, and business uh, courses like data structures and algorithms, machine learning, uh, financial statement analysis exploratory data analysis and visualization, decision-making and, and under uncertainty, of course, game theory and mechanism design, econometrics and microeconomics. These are absolutely foundational topics that uh, you will be uh, rigorously tr getting trained in. And uh, you will have uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, very tempting uh, elective courses for you, like customer and marketing analytics, modern portfolio theory, stochastic op optimization and machine learning in finance, supply chain optimization and analytics, large scale data analysis for public policy, then um, computational social choice, which deals with uh, voting theory, with fair division, and with uh, all the exciting problems which are uh, being pursued currently in most of the leading computer science departments, and artificial intelligence for social good, digital innovation and transformation. So at the end of this four year course, uh, you will be ready to take on some of the most exciting problems uh, in economics and business using all the rigorous training that you go through during this program. So with this, uh, I will close. I know that I have taken much more than the 10 minutes I was supposed to take, but I hope I have conveyed to, the, conveyed to you the excitement of doing a BTEC in data science, economics, and business. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Narahari. Uh, these were, this was a really, really exciting presentation. And as a graduate of economics and undergrad myself, I was thinking that if I had the chance to go back, I wish I could study a program like this instead. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, so I'll start by asking a few follow-up questions to both you and Shrikant. And in the meantime, as uh, for everybody in the audience, please feel free to put in any questions that you have related to this major of Laksha in general in the Q&A box, and we'll pick them up as we go along over the next 30 minutes. Okay, uh, so Shrikant, the first question is to you. Uh, you have built Fractal over the last couple of decades from the time when um, data science did not really exist. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that journey and how you are seeing uh, the applications for a major like this play out at present and potentially for graduates of this major in the next four years? Thank you, Pallavi. So we started thinking that math can help businesses make better decisions. That's really how we started building Fractal. First thing we did was to build mathematical model, models to predict consumer risk. Uh, which was early uh, in the, this is the now what is touted as FinTech and huge uh, number of companies have come up looking at alternate data using banking data and other kinds of data to predict consumer risk, meaning will a customer or a consumer pay back their money when they, then they borrow from you. So that's the kind of work that we started doing with, um, then we saw the first example of this intersection that we were just talking about. In 2001, there was a recession and consumer behavior started changing. And we started to look at, what are people buying, uh, you know, for example, if I'm Hindustan Lever Limited, which makes all kinds of soaps and detergents and so on, am I buying less frequently of those premium products? Am I downgrading the quality of the products that I'm buying? Am I using less of what we, am I becoming more promotion sensitive? How is human behavior changing in anticipation to a crisis? So this is the kind of work, which is absolutely at the intersection. There was nobody at that point of time who had the qualifications to bring in data science, business and economics in the way to develop and solve for problems. Now, 20 years later, it's the hottest topic on the planet, right? AI is really uh, big and using data science to help companies transform their business 
usually across five different dimensions, right? What are companies, big companies trying to do? Think of any big traditional company. They're trying to do is A, they want to build products faster and better. Most products fail. 95% of innovation fails. So how can I build more innovation faster and make it less risky? Secondly, how can I engage with my customers and consumers and tell them what's next, recommend the right products to them and really win their loyalty? How, I, how can I be more efficient as a company? How can I improve the productivity of my employees? How can I improve the productivity of, of my supply chain? That's what they're trying to do. Then they're trying to make better executive decisions. From the time a consumer buys a product, can I really make some business decisions as fast as possible and as bet, best as possible? And finally, they're looking at what's the kind of attacks that startups are making on my big business, right? And can I really build a moat around my business to secure my business? So can I come up with a new subscription model? Netflix came and completely took Blockbuster's business away. But can I predict what is likely to happen to my business? And can I really, really build a defensive wall against uh, disruption of my own business? So this is what companies are trying to do. And if you look at each of these problems, they are at the intersection of what I could call as data science, engineering, and, and business. Right, and business and economics. So that's really the kind of place where I see tremendous opportunity. Next twenty to fifty years will will be um, the the years for professionals of this kind. And if you are interested in this industry, I would say that in the next twenty thirty years, you'll have great prospects overall because the world is looking for these kinds of talent. And in, and it so happens that this is also very exciting work. I mean, if you really feel like predicting human behavior is exciting or designing a mechanism so that humans will behave as you intended them to do so, that's just fascinating stuff, right? So that's really, you get to do some fascinating work and it's also um, at the cutting edge of what is needed today in the world. Thanks a lot, Shikant. Um, so moving on, I think among the questions that we've received, there are a lot of questions related to prerequisites to the major. Uh, so maybe we can talk about that a bit. Uh, the formal prerequisite to take the major is only mathematics. Uh, now I'll just pick up a few specific questions that are being asked. Uh, so Sanjana asked that is computer science or psychology a better subject to study at ISC level for the DSCB program? Uh, Professor Narahari or Shikant, if any of you. Uh, would be. Um, yeah, thank you, Pallavi. Uh, I think I will address this question of, uh, you know, why we are insisting only on mathematics and why we are not insisting on, for example, physics or, uh, you know, any other subject uh, at the class 12 level. I think uh, mathematics is at the core of uh, most of the deep tech and deep science that is happening all over these days. And if you have good grounding in mathematics, and if you are well trained in the fundamentals of uh, mathematics, it will go a long way. There is no need for you to have any other background other than uh, mathematics. If you really want to pick up, uh, you know, the uh, pick up the kind of flow which has been designed in the BTEC DSCB program. Now, the, uh, uh, Shrikant showed us uh, what happens in the first three semesters of the DSCB program. And these three semesters are going to be the key for the next five semesters. So in the first three semesters, you're going to pick up all the foundations, uh, you know, which are going to be the cornerstone, which are going to be you know, used extensively in whatever you're going to do in the next five semesters. The next five semesters will decide the major kind of uh, applications you are going to look at or the major kind of specializations you are going to look at. Whatever the specialization you are going to do in the next five semesters will be pretty well served by what you are going to pick up in these first three semesters. And if you want to do well in these first three semesters, all that you need is very clear thinking, analytical thinking, and uh, a good amount of training in mathematics. And at the 12th level, whether you're from physics or whether you're from chemistry or biology or whatever, it really does not matter. These three semesters will completely transform you uh, into, you know, uh, into you know, mastering all the uh, foundations which are required in a very rigorous way to do very well in the next five semesters. So that is how I would respond 
uh, to this point, Pallavi. Um, is there something else that I should be responding to on this uh, thread? Uh, no, I think this is very helpful. And to other people who've asked questions about similar uh, on similar lines, I think Rajiv, you, you've asked about whether a science background is necessary and whether economics would serve an advantage and so on. Um, the answer to all of those questions is the same. The only prerequisite to the major is math. Um, and the reasons are as Professor Narahari explained. Uh, there's also a question from um, Divya to explain the three semester curriculum a little more. Um, so Sanat, if you could just show that slide again, maybe we can just explain that a bit further. So I can so, go explain. Sure, the, yeah, please go ahead, Shrikant. Yeah. Yeah. So first, okay, if you can put the slide back up, please. Uh, yes, sorry for the days. Uh, I'm just pulling up the latest ones. If you can give me a minute. Yeah, I, I'll do it. Thank you, Pallavi. Um, the idea for the first three semesters are essentially foundations foundational in terms of understanding basics of computer science, basics of, for example, if you see the gray line bar here, it's about computational thinking, basic programming, and introduction to data science and artificial intelligence. This gives you the computer science background. If you see the second column here, which is engineering, math and action, math of uncertainty, modeling with vectors and transform, this is essentially the mathematical underpinning that you will require to be a great engineer. Then if you see these, the fourth column, which is in green here, it is about basically understanding the world around you and getting a sense of the world around you. Foundation of the physical world, nature's machines, intelligent machines, because a lot of engineering is also about building real world things, right? Yes, you may not need exactly this in, in a DSCB program, but this foundation is essential for all engineering. So we believe that as well. And then if you see the last uh, column here, which is, it's a mix of, uh, design thinking, which is essentially one way of problem solving. Design thinking is a way to solve real world problems by actually understanding and empathizing with end users of whatever you're trying to build. That's the that's a technique and you will find it extremely helpful that and other ways of problem solving, which is, for example, critical thinking and scientific reasoning, other way of problem solving. These are fundamentals about uh, of how to solve problems, right? Engineering essentially is science applied to solve real world problems. Right? That's how I think of engineering. And this is really the underpinning of how science can be applied to solve real problems. Fundamentals of microeconomics is again, a course that is about giving you an introduction to microeconomics and what microeconomics means, how are individual companies, individual actors, how do they behave, right? If, I, if I'm a little, if I'm a company and I have all my various units of production, labor, capital, rent, et cetera. How do I use them to make the best product? How do I sell that product? Understanding how these actors work with each other at, at, and how does, when you increase price, why does demand, why, why does demand go down, right? And, and so on, understanding the behavior of individual actors with economic incentives is really fundamentals of microeconomics. And optimization is again, one more, pro, one more area of math. Uh, you have four of these gray areas, which are the math courses. These are the fundamental mathematical tools that you need to build, be a great data scientist. Remember, this is not your run of the mill um, training course, which is going to tell, tell you what, you know, how to run, uh, you know, a TensorFlow uh, software to build AI models. What you are learning is the fu fundamentals of how to solve problems with math and AI and machine learning and so on. So you will get the mathematical underpinning through all these gray bars. And the last one I want to mention is this first column here, which is the Innovation Lab and Grand Challenge Studio. You've heard that it is about, um, there are different ways of learning, but one way of learning is to le learn by doing and experimenting and running stuff, right? Can you really look at a grand challenge and can you sort of work on a very important problem? For example, if you want to uh, end world hunger, right? Very difficult problem. Or if you want to improve climate change or, or create uh, end, uh, you know, sort of, let's say childhood malnutrition in India. If you take a problem like that, which is so huge, and then can you work on it for the next few years in building it out? So that's the, that's the spirit of a grand challenge. Give a problem, big, big challenge 
and get you to work on it and learn over the number over a number of years you can carry the same grand challenge over the four years or change but this idea is about learning by doing so this is the first three semesters this is common to all the four disciplines because we believe that all underlying all of the four programs within plaksha are essentially is essentially a great solid understanding of data science and machine learning uh, and 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 being a great world leader at at large so this is really why we have put together in such a way that once you've done this you have an option to pick and choose the majors that you actually want to uh, go into thanks a lot jitan uh, a related question to that was that does everybody get to pick the majors after the three semesters so just wanted to answer that that you um, can pick your major after the three semesters if you had science in um, if you had physics in class 11th and 12th but if you had uh, only math then you would only be eligible for this major out of the four so it will just be helpful to keep that distinction in mind okay um they just has a question that normally data science and econometrics are subjects offered at a post grad level however here they are offered at an undergrad level does this give some sort of an advantage or create a disadvantage uh, professor nara hari if you would like to take that uh, palavi can you say that again actually uh, yeah so the question is that normally data science and econometrics are subjects offered at a post grad level whereas here they are offered at undergrad So, does it create any form of advantage or disadvantage? Uh, this question is uh, from the. No, not at all. It is best that uh, these courses are actually offered at the undergraduate level. Uh, now, uh, as Shrikant just now explained, in the first three semesters uh, of this course, uh, you know, all the foundational topics are going to be covered, and. Uh, um courses like data science econometrics or even machine learning and so on earlier they were all offered at the post graduate level because uh, you know research was uh, getting done in those subjects and uh, you know there was there was a lack of uh, you know sort of uh, very clean results which can be explained at at a graduate level and so on so most of them were graduate level courses and perhaps uh, being taught only at the phd level and so on however it turns out that uh, whether it is data science or econometrics or machine learning or even game theory for example um, what has happened is that over uh, the past uh, several decades uh, the subjects uh, have become very mature uh, and uh, now there are excellent textbooks which have been written in all of these subjects and there is a set of foundational results upon which uh, all the advanced concepts are developed so it has now become eminently possible to offer uh, all of these courses at the undergraduate level so instead of postponing the learning of all these critical subject to post graduate level it is best that all of these uh, subjects are picked up at the undergraduate level and uh, they are now extremely mature and there are uh, as i said superlative textbooks written on all of these uh, one simple example for you is uh, game theory itself so at um, and not very long ago it was being taught only at the phd level or at the masters level however uh, you would see that uh, it is now being taught very successfully uh, at uh, undergraduate level because the subject itself has become very very mature uh, i have myself written a textbook on game theory and mechanism design and uh, you know there is no reason why this uh, this uh, textbook cannot be used at the undergraduate level in fact uh, fifth semester or sixth semester in the undergraduate program will be uh, you know the optimal time at which a game theory and mechanism design course can be taken so does that help pallavi yes that helps a lot thank you um so next question is from anvesha um she asked that can you elaborate a bit more on how btech in dscd is different from bsc in data science yeah i would like to answer that this is a very good question i absolutely appreciate the the question here we are fundamentally building engineers so we this course will have almost 50% weight on data science we really want to build uh, data scientists and engineers who can also fully understand business and economics 
and as opposed to um, a, a, a BSc program, which may have different objectives. Uh, the idea is of solving real world problems at using data science. And because we are solving real world problems using data science, we are bringing in uh, engineering, uh, uh, sorry, bringing in economics and business disciplines as well here. And this is really what is of the order. I mean, yes, it could have been a, a science program too, but the fact on real world problem solving and the, the mindset of solving problems at scale makes it an engineering program. And it has it will have substantial mathematics and, um, and uh, data science elements and AI elements in it to make it an engineering program rather than a science program. Thanks, Shikan. Okay, so um, an interesting question after this is from Vishal. He's asking that, can you give an example of an insight uh, that created an aha moment for you while you were exploring a topic? Um, Professor Narahari, if you'd want to take that. Okay, I can give uh, not one example, but several examples. Uh, I will just give one example here. Um, you know, if uh, we go back to the DARPA, uh, red balloon challenge. It gives you many aha moments. What was that challenge? Uh, this was sometime in uh, 2011 or 2012. So DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the United States, announced uh, a grand challenge. They said on a particular designated date, 10 red balloons will be launched in 10 undisclosed locations in the United States of uh, America. And whichever team is able to find out these 10 locations where these red balloons uh, uh, are launched will get a prize money of $40,000. This was, the, uh, this was uh, the grand challenge problem. Now, it turned out that more than 40 to 50 teams uh, participated in this challenge. And many of these teams were actually led by leading universities uh, in the United States. And uh, there was a team that was put together by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And uh, eventually this uh, team essentially used uh, game theory and mechanism design at its best in order to come up with an incentive mechanism. What was this incentive mechanism? Uh, there are 10 red balloons. There is $40,000 prize money. Divide 40,000 by 10, you will get $4,000 for each red balloon. So what they did was they recruited a team of volunteers. And, uh, and then every volunteer who was first level recruit, recruited seven, second level volunteers. And then uh, a network of volunteers was recruited and of course, when the volunteers were recruited, it was ensured that all geographical parts of the United States were covered. And this was done in very quick time using uh, email, social media, and so on. And once this team was put together, what they did was they knew that uh, $4,000 is available for each red balloon. So they now used mechanism design. And they said that uh, whoever is able to spot a red balloon will get $2,000. And then whoever recruited the person who found the balloon will get not $2,000, but $1,000. Whoever recruited the person who recruited the person who discovered the red balloon will get not $2,000 or $1,000, but $500. Whoever recruited the person who recruited the person who recruited the person who discovered the red balloon will get $250. So now you have a beautiful geometric series, 2000 plus 1000 plus 500 plus 250 and so on. And you will see that uh, only when, when you sum it up to infinity, it will become equal to $4,000. And here you have only a finite number of players. So it will never become equal to $4,000 and something, something will be left. So they said, uh, you know, for example, let us say uh, that there are only three players in the chain. If there are only three players in the chain, they will get 2,000 plus 1,000 plus 500. So this is $3,500.
So you can see that $500 is still left. They said, we will give that $500 for charity, right? So like this, uh, this mechanism basically was known to all the first level, second level, third level uh, recruits. And uh, you know, once this mechanism was announced, MIT was actually able to recruit a very large number of widespread volunteers. And on the day when these red balloons were launched in 10 different unknown locations in continental America, I mean, who can, who can you know, discover these balloons? It turned out that this particular team, which was recruited by MIT, were able to actually spot these balloons in 10 hours. That is the aha moment for me. In 10 hours, using mechanism design, right? You are able to put together a team which is actually able to, you know, uh, discover all these 10 red balloons. Like this, I think there are any number of such examples. Vikri auction is a fantastic example of a very simple auction which is able to, you know, extract honesty and also truth revelation for, from every player. And, uh, you know, in India, everybody understands what is Satyameva Jayate, right? So this Satyameva Jayate is actually beautifully implemented by the Vikri auction. And uh, you can actually show using very rigorous mathematics, using very rigorous uh, game theory, that uh, this particular auction satisfies what is called the dominant strategy incentive compatibility property, which in Sanskrit is simply Satyameva Jayate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Narahari. That was um, that was a really, really exciting example. Um, so uh, moving on, I think one of the questions that is coming up and Divya has asked is that if a student doesn't get a job by campus placement, will there be offers in the general market and are companies advertising for such qualifications? Um, so Shikant, given that you have been, uh, one, you represent industry and also you've been closely involved with placements for the Tech Leaders Fellowship. Uh, would you give a little sense of what is the kind of industry demand that one can expect for graduates of this major? Like I think I've already mentioned to you guys, it, the prospects for this, uh, this discipline is, are enormous. Nobody has imagined a program like this before. I have to tell you that this is quite unique in its, in its way this engineering program, including data science, business and economics is very rare. But this combination is a combination that can solve great problems. This is the kind of people that every company wants to recruit today. Today, Fractal High, for example, last year we hired from various engineering colleges, 250 uh, what we call as Imagineers. And we had to train them for four months to become something like this, four to six months, right? From their, after their engineering degrees. If we had a program like this, we would, you know, we don't have, we didn't have to train them. They, they would be ready plug and play for the kinds of problems that Fractal solves. Uh, so I would expect that the likes of Google, Microsoft, McKinsey, BCG, Bain, all these kinds of companies would, uh, would be excited to hire uh, people. Uh, you know, for example, the say area called mechanism design that Professor Narayan is talking about. That is the most cutting edge area today. Um, yeah, my friend Kamal Jain, I think, uh, Professor Narari, you, you probably know him very well. He's, uh, he's one of the guys who's a for forefront of this. And he's, does, he's done work with eBay, for example, to ask, ex explain to them how they should design their whole auction mechanism so that they can uh, get better outcomes. Things like that. These are exciting uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, my guess is that this will be one of the hottest disciplines out of the Plaksha program in the next four years. Uh, and it will also be a very widely uh, in-demand program across the globe. Uh, Plaksha is one of the first to launch something like this, but I do feel like this is the this is kind of the thing about reimagining higher education. We have to really see where the world is moving and build it before it is um, build it build it before uh, it's it's fully required. So today, uh, companies are hiring thousands and thousands of data scientists every year, hundreds of thousands of data scientists every year. And they're all training people. They wouldn't have to if we had a program like this. And that's why we're building this program. Thank you, Shrikant. Um, so I think we've covered a lot of questions related to the data science, economics, and business major. We also have some questions that are about Plaksha in general. Uh, so maybe we can move on to that. Uh, 
one question is about what distinguishes Laksha from other universities in the country. Um, Shrikant, if you'd want to take that as well. Yeah, I think you know, the, the thing that excited me most about actually joining forces with a bunch of other people is just the quality of the entrepreneurs involved, right? And everyone with a passion, mission to uh, reimagine higher education, no profit motive because it's a philanthropic initiative, right? It is not some Ambani or uh, Birla or anything like that. There is no uh, industrialist behind this. This is a collective philanthropy of brilliant, you know, hundred brilliant people around the world. I mean, I would not call myself worthy of being in that group, but it's a fantastic group of people who have come together. So that's one thing very unique and distinguishing about this. The passion and the and real passion is to build an institution for the next hundred years and something that can, um, that can reimagine higher education and redefine how engineering is done. Second is the global partnerships. And with uh, the likes of Stanford, uh, Berkeley, Purdue, uh, we've got the best of the of the faculty around those those uh, great institutions and some Indian institutions as well, and to imagine the education, the, the course content, and they are envious of Plaksha. Every time we have a conversation with them, they say that, oh, wait, I wish I could do this in, in Berkeley because this would have been great, but just that it's not allowed as of, as of right now to do something like that. So this is the uh, this is the second aspect which I think is is unique. And the third is just the boldness of the mission, right? We are not constrained by how the world has been so far. We are building a brand new vision for how education institutions should be in the next 50 to 100 years and get this brilliant set of faculty and students. So like Ashoka has done it, right? These founders have been behind Ashoka. Uh, some of these founders have been behind Ashoka and Ashoka has in, in a few short years, it's become a phenomenally reputed institution uh, for the liberal arts. That's exactly what we intend to do for engineering education. I went to an IIT. But I do feel like if Plaksha was around, I would probably go here because I wouldn't get a DSEB or a CS and AI major at IIT today. Great. Um, thank you so much. I think the last question that we can take on this and then we can move on to admissions related questions um, is related to higher studies. Um, so Professor Narahari, if you, if you could throw some light on what are um, the higher studies sort of opportunities that are possible after this. And given that the major has uh, three cornerstones in data science, economics, and business, um, how does it prepare students for PhDs in a variety of areas? Okay, uh, so let me cover uh, the rich possibilities of higher education uh, for the students. Uh, I will start with India, and then I will go international. And in India, I will start with my own institution, Indian Institute of Science. Uh, we would be very glad to take uh, the graduates of the BTEC program here as our MTEC students. Now, the MTEC program in IASC is easily uh, among the best programs, uh, extremely uh, rigorous. And then the graduates of the MTEC program not only write research papers, uh, uh, you know, but also they do lots of innovation oriented projects. Some of them actually become entrepreneurs and so on. Um, of course, the caveat here is that uh, if you want to get admitted to an MTech program in IISC or uh, IITs, then you will have to write what is called the gate exam, the graduate aptitude test in engineering. And uh, with the kind of training that you are going to get in data science, economics and business, you will be able to write uh, the gate exam in computer science without uh, any problem. Uh, so there are also other computer science programs like uh, mathematics and so on, um, gate programs, gate papers like mathematics and so on, which again, you will be able to write. Uh, so these are the, and of course, uh, you know, you can also go for a direct PhD in the Indian uh, institutions uh, using you know, a variety of programs. For example, there is a program of the Confederation of Indian Industry and the Prime Minister uh, Research Fellowship, um, which, which will give you a very handsome fellowship to join a direct PhD program in IISC, IITs, and the top uh, institutions in the country. And this is uh, in areas like uh, you know, computer science, 
and uh, many of these uh, institutions also now have a data science department and so on. So a direct PhD is also a possibility in some of the leading institutions in India. Uh, okay, so now let us uh, go uh, international. Um, I would say that after doing a BTEC program here, uh, you will you will be eminently eligible for an MS program and also a direct PhD program in most US universities in either the computer science department or in the economics department or in a business school. Uh, so um, what is the example of the of, of an outstanding computer science school? For example, you can go for a PhD in MIT, you can go for a PhD in Stanford University or a PhD in Carnegie Mellon University or University of California, Berkeley, or any of the universities with which Plaksha is going to have partnerships without any problem after your BTEC. Now, um, this is as far as uh, a PhD in computer science or data science goes. You can also go for a PhD uh, in economics and in the best schools uh, all over the world, and you will be able to go for a PhD uh, in a business school also. And of course, you can also do an MBA. If you are one of those uh, MBA types, you can also do MBA. And for MBA, uh, you don't have to look beyond the IIMs uh, in India. And of course, you can also go to many international schools uh, for your MBA program. So that would be uh, another opportunity. So I think uh, the BTEC in DSEB program will be a gateway to some of the best schools in the world in the areas of computer science, data science, economics, and uh, business. And you will also be able to get into uh, MBA programs. Does that? Uh... Yes, that answers the question. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, with this, I'd hand over to my colleague Kanchi Khanna here, uh, who leads uh, who leads admissions for Plaksha, to talk a little bit about the admissions process. And there are some questions related to that um, in the Q and A, which will get answered in the process. Thank you, Pallavi. Uh, I did go through the questions, and even though we hadn't planned for this to be uh, around admissions, but uh, I knew there would be some. So we'll show a few slides. Uh, there are some some of you who wanted to know the process and also, uh, you know, certain things about it. So I'll try and answer all those that I read earlier. And then if there are uh, more questions after that, we'll be happy to answer. So uh, the admissions process at Plaksha is holistic. Uh, it's a two stage process. The first stage, of course, is an application form, which you can fill in uh, on the website. Uh, it's free of cost, of course. You fill it in, send it to us and we will be reading your application. And uh, each application is read by multiple people. Uh, we shortlist people whom we feel would be, a good, would, would be a good fit or we feel would be a good fit for Plaksha. And we call them for the second stage, which is an interview and a case study interaction. Uh, you know, when they come in, it's, it's uh, a one hour, um, you know, they engage with a case, case study and then about half an hour of a conversation one-on-one -on -one with the panel. Now, a lot of you want to know whether you can apply with predicted grades. Uh, to be honest, everyone who fills in the form has to fill in a pre predicted grades if they don't have their board score already. So if you're a gap year student, you have your final board marks, fill them in. If not, then do fill in the predicted marks section. Now, given the uncertainty, you know, given the lockdowns that have been happening, we allowed students to self-predict. Uh, because many of you weren't able to go back to your school, uh, schools get your teachers to send in the predicted. So you could self predict, go ahead and do what, uh, write down whatever you think you'll be able to get. And if you do have a standardized score, uh, send that in too. Now what happens is if you give us a predicted grade, uh, you are eligible for a conditional offer. And now given the second wave of COVID, we're not sure whether the board exams will happen or when they'll happen. So it's not a great idea to keep yourself in that conditional bracket. So I would encourage you to go ahead and take some tests. And I understand that JE mains has been postponed or SAT might not happen, ACT. Uh, and the KVP by, of course, if you haven't taken it, you can't take it now. So the only test that's left out there is the Pearson undergraduate test. It's a test you can take online. 
uh, any time of the day. So I think between 9 a.m. to 6, 6 p.m. every day, you can take schedule your test. You can take it multiple times. Um, you know, results are uh, declared every Friday. So you can do it from home. So do that test, take it, and if you have a good score, share it with us because that gives you, uh, makes you eligible to get a firm offer from us. Uh, if you keep yourself in the conditional bracket, it'll be difficult for us because we don't know what, when you will be able to share your board results with us and you would be continuously you know, wondering whether this will get converted or not. So do that, try and give us a standardized score. Some of you have already taken the J scores, but you thought you would improve it and you're not sharing it with us. Please do that as well. You know, if, if it's an above average score, do share it because it's not just your academic scores that, you know, in that sort of decide whether we give you an offer or not. It's your complete profile. We are looking at your academic scores. We are looking at your extracurriculars, your co-curricular projects, and your academic ability is being picked not just from your school scores or your test scores, but also from how you engage with the case, case study. So don't worry so much about a particular score, send it in and let us evaluate. You could even mention in the, in the application form saying I'm taking so-and-so exam and we'll be able to share the results in a few days or whatever, right? Uh, the application form has opportunity for you to share all of that, your ECAs, CCAs. Uh, we would want you to write a couple of essays because we want to know how you think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and the, the interview which happens at the second stage is really a conversation about whatever you've already shared with us. So it's not an interview interview. Um, sometimes there are some technical questions, but just to basically understand your basic concepts in math and physics, uh, but uh, not really for physics if you haven't been a science student, just basic math questions. And otherwise, it's more of a conversation as to you know what your motivations are, what your aspirations are from such a program and so on, right? So, so don't worry about all that. Uh, we understand uh, the difficult times that you're going in and we'll be uh, happy to answer and happy to make you feel comfortable throughout the process as well. So that's what the application process is. Someone also asked about uh, the math requirements. Now, uh, I know that uh, IB has two kind of maths, the AA and the AI. And then in both of them, you have the higher level and the standard level. So for AA, we will, we will accept both HL and SL. For AI, we would accept only the HL, right? Uh, for CBSC, somebody has asked about applied math. Uh, for this year, not, nobody's applied to us with the applied math, but I have been brought to understand that applied math is for somebody who's not very keen in taking on a rigorous math kind of an undergraduate program. So if you are interested in this, I would suggest that you do take up the standard math and not the applied math. Uh, that'll help you because you know if you come to a program which is as rigorous as ours, you might at some point struggle with, with the concept. So it's better to keep your math at a higher level rather than at a, at a you know, standard level. Uh, and we could move on. Are there any more slides that I'm required to show? Yeah, the round three deadline is May 7th. Um, keeping the times in, in mind, we were at the, there was a round which was ending sometime in the middle of June, but we realized since the boards have gotten postponed, students have time on hand and they can submit their applications now. So we thought, you know, while they are waiting for their exams to happen, we could, we could get this process out out of the way. So if you have started your application, please do complete it and send it in by May 7th. We'll process it. We generally take four to five weeks to process all the applications of a round and give out the decisions. And, and that's what we'll do with these. Right? So sometimes say, you know, uh, mid-June. Uh, we also offer uh, scholarships of various kinds. We have a very generous financial aid. Uh, which is need-based. We also have merit scholarships. We are also supported in scholarships by some, some of our founders and donors, like, uh, like the very, very prestigious Bharti Scholarship. Uh, if you become a Bharti Scholar, it goes beyond financial, need, uh, financial assistance. Right? Uh, there's mentorship, there's opportunity to work at the Bharti uh, companies. There's, uh, there's a community of scholars that'll, that'll build up over the years and you know, you, you continue to engage with Plaksha even after you move on from Plaksha. 
So uh, Bharti is now the first one to come in, but there are other scholarships which are coming in. So if you are a bright student and we want you to be a part of the Plaksha cohorts, don't worry about the finances. We'll help you manage those. So you should just worry about putting your best foot forward and uh, really making a great application to us. Uh, I hope I've answered most of the questions, but if there are any, Pallavi, you can let me know. I think you've answered the questions, Kachi. Um, so we're also up to time. Uh, so thank you so much for all the participants for attending the session and asking all of these insightful questions that allowed us to go a lot deeper. Thank you so much, Shrikant and Professor Narahari for your time and the wonderful presentations. Um, I apologize to anybody whose question we accidentally missed. I think we've managed to cover nearly all questions. But if you have anything else, please feel free to write in to us anytime, call us, and we'd love to answer that. Um, and with that, thank you so much, everybody, for your time. And good evening. Take care. <laughs>